welcome our radio audience. We welcome our internet audience. We welcome all of you. We are so glad that you have joined us here for our continued revival services here at North Etowah Baptist Church. Welcome to you, especially if you're a guest with us. I sure hope you feel welcome. We hope that we are uh, accommodating and hospitable to you and just feel at home. Hope you enjoy being with us. If you've not been drawn yet by our evangelist, Joe McKeever, he's over here on my left, your right. At the end of the service, he'll do, he'll do some more drawings. You see all around this building, uh, you see all the ones that we've done so far. We make a copy of, of the drawing, and then we post one on the wall, and you get to keep the original. Take it and color it, make another copy of it, color it, put it on your refrigerator, show your wife how blessed she is to have you. Amen. All right, I'll say something about the women next time. Great to have you. Thank you for being here. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Let's welcome His Holy Spirit to this place. Father, thank you so much for all that you have done and all that you are doing and all that you're going to do. We praise your name and we thank you. We thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to praise your name. And Lord, everything we do tonight, let it bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Just be blessed by our offering to you, God. And just, let, just let it be a sweet savor to you, be to you, God. And let each person here be blessed for their attendance. God, be with the weather that's, that's coming our way, as, uh, whatever may come. God, you, you're in control. Be with those that have lost, maybe in, in tragedy with their houses or, or others that have lost loved ones. I pray you be with them because tonight we come to this place to worship you, praise you in the storm, in the valley, but also on the mountaintop. Thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to bring Him our offering of worship and praise tonight as we sing some great old gospel hymns.
ushers, come on forward for our offering time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, how, how great it is to worship God Almighty, isn't it? I'd rather have Jesus to an unclouded day. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, choir. Thank you, congregation, for great worship. We're ready to take an offering now for our revival expenses. If you can give, we appreciate you giving. And this goes to our evangelist, Dr. Joe McKeever, and to the expenses for having this revival. We are so blessed to have the opportunity to just be here. And now, as you give, you just give according to the way God leads you to give. And we appreciate it, and I know God appreciates it. And you will be blessed because that money is God's already anyway. And he just loaned it to us for a short period. So we're glad to give it back to him. Let's go to him in prayer and let's just tell him how glad we are. We'd rather have him. Oh God, we would rather have you than anything. We'd rather have you than anything this world could offer. we rather have you than any vast expanse or, expense or money and gold and silver and diamonds. We'd rather have you, God, than anything this world can offer. And Lord, we've heard about that unclouded day, and we read about that unclouded day. We've read about the, in the book, the only true living word of God. And we know and we recognize and we proclaim our Lord and Savior. And until he comes again, I pray that we would be on our march to Zion that we would be standing true and being the salt and the light that you have called us to be, God, and let us just be proclaiming Jesus Christ above all as we go forward. Thank you for every penny that people are about to give. Lord, we just pray that it will continue to go into all the world. As, as Joe said the other day, we don't know what part of any offering is going to go to to. Uh, and how it's going to bless all around the world. And we pray, God, that every penny will be blessed for the furtherance of your kingdom. Thank you for great worship. In Jesus' name, amen. We're blessed to have a dear brother in Christ. Um, most everybody knows Brother Ray Calfrey. Uh, he's coming to share tonight with us as we present the Pass Me Not, Old Gentle Savior, one of my favorite Fanny Crosby hymns. And that needs to be our prayer tonight, that as we are here, we cry out to Jesus, don't, don't pass us by as we, His Spirit moves among us. So.
stand together once again and join our voices as we sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus and Victory in Jesus because it's all about Him. All God's people said together, amen. Wow, come on up here, Brother Joe McKeever. 
Thank you for great worship tonight. I had the awesome, wonderful opportunity again today, and I want to give a great big shout out to our local schools again. Uh, we had the opportunity to go to Christ Legacy Academy, Dr. Shane Arnold, this morning. Uh, Dr. McKeever drew over 120 children there and, and adults. And then we went to Central High School with the freshman class during fifth period with Dr. Lori Hutchison there at the principal. We appreciate her. And we drew and we drew until his hand was like this. Uh, but he, those kids, I'll just go ahead and tell you, fifth period ended and Joe and I were left in the auditorium with kids that wouldn't go to class. So I told him we were an accomplice. So, but anyway, uh, we had a great time and there were other kids coming in even that we're not part of and they were wanting to be drawn by this man. He uses drawing to bring people to Christ, to share the good news, to tell people how God has blessed him with this ability and talent and then to turn it and talk to him about Jesus. Tonight, that's what he's here to talk to us about. Wherever he goes with the, with the word, I know it's going to come from the word of God, and I thank you, Dr. Joe McKeever. Let me pray with you, friend. Dr. Joe McKeever is our friend, and we pray, God, that you would be with him tonight. Anoint his voice. Let him have the words that we need to hear. Give us open hearts and minds to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. He sure helped me and even ran errands for me a time or two. By the way, it's been a wonderful worship service tonight, Brother Jason. Thank you so much. And nobody has worked harder than Miss Kay back here. This lady really earned her pay, whatever it is, on the piano. <laughs> and choir, thank you for your faithfulness. And Brother Ray, where are you? Uh, oh, okay, good. Thank you for joining us tonight. That uh, saxophone was great. Well, it's good to see you tonight. I've got to tell you, we've been having, we had a lot of great music tonight, so it's probably a good time to tell you my, my uh, Squire Parsons story. Squire Parsons tells this one himself about a preacher from America who was preaching some uh, crusades across Russia. He had an interpreter with him. They'd be two nights in this city and go on to the next city and preach two nights and and everything, and in one of the cities, the preacher was, uh, he was preaching about heaven, and he really got into it, and got carried away, and broke into song, and started singing Beulah Land, but he had not prepared the interpreter for that, so when the service was over, he walked over to him and said, I hope you were able to handle that, the interpreter said, Pastor, you might want to have a seat, I didn't know what Russian for Beulah Land was, so I made it Disneyland. <laughs> Which, if you stop and think about it, is just about the idea that some people have of heaven. And Miss Tara, that was a great solo there at the front. i rather have Jesus. Thank you for that. Well, um, several scriptures tonight for you. And we're going to start tonight in the last three verses of Habakkuk. I'll give you 15 minutes to find it. <laughs> Actually, Habakkuk is easy to find. So it's the fifth book from the end of the Old Testament. The last three verses of Habakkuk, there's nothing else in the Bible like these three verses. You need to memorize them, Christian, because they're going to come in handy for you somewhere along the way. Habakkuk 3, 17, 18, 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like, like hind's feet, like the feet of the sure-footed mountain goat. He causes me to walk on my high places." 
I don't know if anybody in here uh, is familiar with uh, farm living, but uh, if you are, you know that what he has just described here in these verses is economic disaster. He said there's nothing in the field, nothing in the barn, nothing in the orchard, nothing in the pasture, nothing in the cellar, nothing in the, in the crib, nothing in the safe deposit box, nothing in the pantry, and yet I'm still going to rejoice in the Lord. My friend, if you can rejoice in the Lord at times like that, then you either don't live in the real world or you know something. Anybody can rejoice when the bills are paid and you've got money in the bank and the boss says a little something in the pay envelope for you this week and your husband or your wife thinks you hung the moon and your grandchildren adore you and your team is winning and your church is prospering and you feel great and the doctor said, those tests look good and I'll see you again in about a year. Anybody can rejoice then. But let's see you rejoice when not only your kid's not doing well, you don't even know where they are. Your team hasn't won in memory. The boss says we're moving the company to Mexico. The, the doctor says, I need to see you back in here tomorrow morning. And the love of your life has either served you with divorce papers or you've just come from the cemetery where you have left him or her. Now let's hear you rejoice. If you can rejoice now, you either aren't facing reality or you know something. Second scripture I want to give you is Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. Luke 10 and verse 20. The background of this is that the Lord Jesus has sent his disciples out on a preaching mission. He's treating them sort of like seminary students. They've been in class for, for several months now. And now he sends them out to try out preaching the gospel. And uh, we have much more of his assignment to them over in Matthew 10, verse 16 and following. And uh, don't turn to that, but uh, uh, Matthew does not tell us what happened when they came back from their preaching mission. Now, we don't know whether they're out there for two or three days or two or three weeks or what, but Luke tells us that when they came back, they were sky high. They said, Lord, it was wonderful. The spirits were subject to us, that the devils were subject to us, which is shorthand for saying we saw miracles, we saw lives changed, saw people saved, saw people healed. And they were beside themselves with joy. And the Lord Jesus said, you're right. In fact, he said, I saw Satan fall, and we wish we knew more about what he meant by that. But then he says in verse 10, do not rejoice, excuse me, verse 20, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. The Lord knew something the disciples were going to find out. The day would come when they would return from their preaching missions empty-handed. No great stories, no big numbers. In fact, they'd do well to escape with their lives, and sometimes they didn't even do that. And the Lord knew that if their joy was based on the results, sometimes they'd be up and sometimes they'd be down. Sometimes they'd be rejoicing and sometimes they'd be complaining. And he didn't want to have any part of that. He wants us always rejoicing. In John 16, verse 22, Jesus has said that he's given us his joy. And he said, no one can take my joy from you. Many of you remember how um, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So that's the secret to rejoicing. Rejoicing in the Lord, not in circumstances, not in the numbers, not in our successes, not in our team, not in prosperity, not in our health, but in the Lord. And when we do that, we are always rejoicing. I... Uh, I do a lot of work with senior adults. I'm not right sure why. I hope to become one someday. Um, but I'll, I'll sometimes get up and, and they'll introduce me and I'll say, well, I've driven up here, you know, to, to, uh, to congratulate you on the two greatest blessings of your life. Number one, you're saved. You're born again. Your name is written in the book of life. And number two, you're old. 
and they laugh. And I say, you don't necessarily think of that as a blessing, but many of us can remember friends we've had through the years who would have given everything they owned to have lived as long as we have lived, to have seen their children grow up, to have held their grandbabies in their arms. And some of us have even had the privilege of seeing our grandbabies grow into adulthood. October the 1st, I was in Missouri and did the wedding for my 27-year-old granddaughter. And my youngest grandchild is now 15 years old. So I have been blessed, and believe me, I know that. Now, senior adults, I think, sort of fall into two groups here. There's some senior adults who love to complain. They love to be negative, and there's some, thank the Lord, who love to rejoice. I was pastor of two ladies who were who sort of symbolized both groups, and they were pretty much they were both of them around 80 years of age, and they they I was pastor of them at the same time. I don't even know if they knew each other. It was later on I looked back at them and, and uh, look back on that period and realized that Maybell Montgomery and Mary Hazel Miller were both. They were just polar opposites in this. Now, now Maybell M- Montgomery was she was a uh, lived in a little humble house off the hill from the church. Never had much of this world's goods. I have no idea what her circumstances in life were, or her family, or anything. But every time you saw her, she was always just bubbling over with joy in the Lord. Now, Mary Hazel Miller, on the other hand, I was always complaining. Nothing ever suited her. She was always in aches and pains. And I'd go to see her in the hospital, and she was in there a lot because there's something about that attitude, I think, that poisons your system and keeps you sick. And I'd go in, and good morning, Mary Hazel. And she said, oh, Pastor, I don't know why, where all those doctors and nurses are. I haven't seen them. Nobody's been in here this morning. They're neglecting men. And she goes on like that a little bit. And I said, well, how about your sisters? Have been, but no, they've been by. They told me they're coming, but they haven't come. So finally, I'm grabbing for straws. And I'll say, well, how about your Sunday school class? No, they've not been here either. And it was this way every time I visited her. So one time, now I was a young pastor and stupid. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> I decided, I wonder if anybody has ever told Mary Hazel why people avoid her, I believe I will. (laughs) I pulled the chair up to the hospital bed and I said, Mary Hazel, I want to tell you something that maybe nobody's ever told you. I want to tell you why people avoid you. (laughs) And Mary Hazel, you have the worst attitude of anybody I've ever seen. Nobody can stand to be around you. (laughs) And I waited for the explosion. And all she said was, Dr. McKeever, and went right back to criticize it. Now, Maybell Montgomery, on the other hand, they called us in the church office one day, and they said, Miss Montgomery has fallen and broken her hip, and we have her in emergency at the hospital. And I dropped what I was doing and drove down there. I walked in the back door there, the emergency, and she spotted me. She was lying on a little gurney over here, and she spotted me, and she called over so everybody could hear her. Praise the Lord, preacher. He left me one good leg. (laughs) I said, what in the world are we going to do with you? Now, friend, I want to tell you something. If you're one who loves to complain, as I remember now I'm talking to senior adults. If you're one who loves to complain and worry about the future, there are actually some reasons to do so, and I'm going to give you four reasons to worry about the future. Number one, you're old. Number two, you're getting older. Three, you're going to die. <laughs> and four, between now and dying, chances are you're going to have a lot of medical problems and medical bills. So if you want to worry about the future, get on with it. However, most of us don't want to worry and complain. We'd rather rejoice. I got some really good news for you. If you want to rejoice in the Lord, there are 10,000 reasons to do so. We're saved. We're born again. Our name is written in the book of life. Our sins are gone. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The Bible says the transgressions against us have been nailed to the cross. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary. Our sins have been separated from us as far as the east is from the west. He has been them in the deepest part of the ocean. He says, your sins and iniquities, I'll remember no more. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, overshadowed by his love, undergirded by his power. He goes before us, comes behind us. He gives us the Bible, gives us the Holy Spirit, gives us uh, a charge, a message, uh, a work to do in this world, gives us promises that are out of this world, says, we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever forever. 
We're going to have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades another way, reserved in heaven for you, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Why aren't you rejoicing? If you want to rejoice, you got plenty of reason, but you have to choose. You have to choose. Well, let me take a break for just a second here. I want to show you in the 16th chapter of Luke how it's done. Scripture shows us in the 16th chapter of Luke how it's done. It's not Joe showing you anything. 16th chapter of Luke is the story of Paul and Silas on what we call the second missionary journey. They are in Philippi in the Macedon, Macedonia area. Some of you history buffs know that Alexander the Great's father was Philip of Macedon. So here's Philippi, named for him, in Macedonia. There, his district. And uh, this, is a, this is a major city. And they, Paul and Silas, are having great results. All they're doing is going around preaching the gospel and seeing lives change. So they're not offending people. They're not stirring up anything. However... There is uh, one thing that bothers Paul. There is a servant girl, there a slave girl, probably a teenager, who is possessed by a demon, and some unscrupulous men own her, and they're making money from her because the Bible says that demon has given her a spirit of fortune telling. A little reminders to us to beware of anybody who's telling fortunes. And so they're making money for him, and, she, and yet she finds him, herself drawn to the Apostle Paul. And she keeps telling people, to, these men are prophets of the Most High, now you listen to them. But she's not qualified to be speaking, you know, witnessing for the Lord because she's demon-possessed. And finally, Paul gets a bait of this, turns around and speaks to the demon inside her and casts him out. Suddenly, the girl is normal and whole and has no supernatural power and no devil within her, and her owners are furious because they just lost their investment. So they stir up a mess there in the town and stir up the crowd, and they get the magistrates, the local city council involved in it, and uh, because Paul and Silas are foreigners, and they've, they've created a, a, a an uproar throughout the city in the last few weeks as they've been preaching. People have known who they were, and a lot of people have not quite known what to do with them. So now they have an excuse, and so they arrest them and have them beaten, and they call the jailer to them, and they tell him, now you put these, uh, these two men in the most secure part of your jail and hold them overnight. We will deal with them in the morning. Well, the jailer knows instructions when he gets them, so he takes these men with their bloody back, their, their, uh, their, 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 the, the, the wounds are untreated. He takes them down up to his jail, locks them into the stocks, which is in the interior part of the jail, locking their feet into them. And then he locks the outside part of the jail, and he spends the night. My guess is, my hunch is, that he didn't normally spend the night at the jail because he did have assistance. And... Uh, so he stays there, but he knows that he has got to make sure that these men, nothing happens. And the Bible says in verse 25 of Acts chapter 16, that about midnight, Paul and Silas began praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Stop right there. Now, can you believe this? These men are in incredible pain. Their backs are open wounds. Do you suppose, do you suppose Paul said, Silas, I just feel like singing? I don't think so. You know, if that had been Mark Wade and Joe McKeever in there, we would have said, Lord, where are you? Lord, we're trying to do good, and, and they look how they treated us, Lord. But these men are rejoicing in the Lord. Now, they're doing it by faith. They're doing it by faith. Now, you know what? There's, a, there's an attitude among some of God's people that if I don't feel it, then it would be faith to do it. And the right answer is no, it would be faith to do it if you don't feel it. If you say, I have to feel it before I can do something, that makes your emotions the ruler of your life, the Lord of your life. 
Your feelings are fickle, friend. You can't trust your feelings. Your feelings vary based on hormones, whether you got enough rest, what the last person said to you, how your wife is treating you, what you ate last night, or a thousand other things. You don't trust your feelings. We do it by faith, not by feelings. My dad gave me a, a great little line about this. My dad was 90 years old and, and uh, lived in North Alabama on the family farm. And, and I had been invited to speak at, a, at a, an annual luncheon that the Alabama Baptists put on in Montgomery. And they have the governor and his staff come in. They have the state Supreme Court. And they have the legislature and, and leading pastors from around the state. And so when they invited me, I said, can I bring my dad? And they said, of course. So the night before this event, my brother went up and spent the night with mom and dad. And then early that morning, he brought dad down to Montgomery, about 150 miles. And uh, about 10 o'clock or so, uh, my brother and my dad walked in the hotel room where my wife and I were. My wife gave dad a big hug, and she said, how are you feeling, Pop? Now, remember, he's 90 years old. And my dad said, well, when I got up this morning, I decided not to ask myself that question because I might not like the answer. <laughs> well, is that great or what? You know what some of us do? We, we ask ourselves how we're feeling so we can decide what we're going to do today. Am I going to go to church? I don't feel like it. You know, my mother was probably 90 or more when, uh, and I wrote this in my journal. That's the reason I remembered it. I was calling her, I, I would call her every Sunday morning when I was going to preach and, uh, so she said that John, one of her grandsons, had spent the night with her. She had been widowed by then. And uh, she said, at breakfast, she said, John, are you going to church? And John said, oh, Granny, I don't feel like it. And she said, oh, honey, if I only went when I was, was feeling like it, I'd never go to church. See, you don't take counsel of your fears or your feelings. Don't ask yourself how you're feeling. Go do it. You do it regardless. You do it by faith. So Paul and Silas were in the jail, and they were hurting, and they were miserable, and they did not know what tomorrow morning would hold. But they, according to verse 25, they were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and get this, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Do you see that? The other prisoners were listening. They are always listening. They're always listening. Now, the jailer was listening too. And the reason we know that is what happened next. Sometime that night, the Lord in heaven sent an angel with a jail-sized earthquake. And he rattled that building and shook those walls and busted the seams in the walls. And the doors of the jail opened up and the chains broke. The jailer awakes with a start, calls an assistant, ring of a torch, and he sees down the hallway there doors hanging off their hinges and chains out in the, in the hall and he knows he has lost his prisoners. And the Bible says he's about to fall on his sword. He's going to save the magistrates the trouble of executing him in the morning. And the apostle Paul calls, everybody don't hurt yourself, we're all still here. <clears throat> that was one more bizarre thing that happened that night. And that's why, how we're to understand what happened next. The jailer ran in and fell before Paul and Silas and said, I want what you've got. What must I do to be saved? Now, the only way he could have asked such a question was he had to have been listening to what they said the night before as they were praying and singing hymns. They had to be talking about Jesus and salvation. And he said, I want to be saved. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved you and your whole household. So he believed, got saved, and now he does something that is so surprising that an hour earlier he would have died before he did it. He took them out of the jail and took them down to his house. Woke up his wife and mother-in-law, the Bible says his household, and uh, one of them got up and cooked some sc scrambled eggs and the other put salve on their back. And meanwhile, Paul and Silas are talking to the household whoever is in the household, about Jesus. And they all got saved, and they went down to the river in the middle of the night, and Paul and Silas baptized them. Then they came back to the house, and Paul says to the jailer, now put us back in jail. The jailer took them back up, 
And the next morning, I, I love the, the drama of this. The next morning, the magistrate sent a um, messenger up to the jailer and said, okay, I guess they've suffered enough, turn them loose. And Paul said, I don't think so. We're Roman citizens. You don't deal with Roman citizens this way, jailing them and, and, uh, and punishing them for no cause, without just cause, without giving them a chance to defend themselves. And the magistrate said, holy smoke, nobody told us they were Roman citizens. We are in big trouble. So now they came and begged Paul and Silas to please leave, and we will escort you out of town to keep the mob from, from getting a hold of you. And on the way out of town, Paul and Silas went by the house of Lydia, where the church was meeting, where the, the church in that town met, and to tell them two things. One, we're leaving, probably pick up their, their rest, whatever clothing they had left there, and to tell them, by the way, somebody go over to the jail and uh, visit with the jailer and his family because we've got some new converts in the family. And a uh, wonderful story. But don't, don't miss the fact that at the end of Acts 16, 25, it says the other prisoners were listening. Friends, sometimes God will let you and me go through a mess because, and because the world is now going to be watching to see how you handle this. So you and I, if we are so self-centered, we'll think, well, why has this happened to me? Well, the answer is God thinks that you can be trusted to do this thing right because people are watching. And if you'll get it right, then people will come to Christ because of your faithfulness. And that's what happened in this case. They won people to Christ because they learn to rejoice in the Lord and not in circumstances. Now Jesus said, you are, I want you rejoicing because your names are written in heaven. Can I ask you a little question about that? When's the last time you have rejoiced and given thanks to the Lord that you're saved, that your name is written in heaven, that you're a child of God, that when you die you're going to heaven, that your sins are gone, that the charges against you have been dealt with on the cross. When's the last time you've done that? You know what this means is that Jesus says, I want you rejoicing in something that is secure and lasting and unchanging. Now, you and I believe that the Bible teaches once saved, always saved, that our salvation is secure. Now, we didn't make that up. It's right in the scripture. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 28, 29, I'm giving them eternal life and no one can pluck them out of my hand. My father is greater than everybody and nobody can pluck them out of my father's hand. So this is the security of salvation. Jesus said, I give them eternal life. I, I, I'm just sort of amazed at the way people say, well, it's eternal unless you choose to do such and such. Well, then it's not eternal. It, you know, we, we treat this like it's a vacuum cleaner guarantee. Well, you know, the, the, the warranty is, is void if you use the vacuum cleaner. You know, it's, war, it's void if you, you know, uh, do, do this or do that. Well, there's no such thing. I give them eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, who? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life, everlasting life, everlasting life. Have you given thanks to the Lord today for everlasting life? That's why he has given you. We don't understand what all it means, how it can be. We don't understand the, what heaven's going to be like. We just have little glimpses, what some may call rumors of heaven in scripture. But it's not going to be like anything we've ever thought of. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Have you given thanks to the Lord for that? Well, I don't feel like it. Listen, friend, give him thanks anyway, regardless of how you're feeling. Jack Hinton is a retired Baptist preacher over in the eastern part of North Carolina. When Jack was pastoring in New Bern, North Carolina, last church he served, he took a group one summer on a mission trip into the Caribbean. And, uh, and Brother Jason, if you're going to take a mission trip, you might as well go to the Caribbean. They need the Lord down there too. And uh, while they were there, they went to the island, little island nation of Tobago. And the missionary who was their host took them one day to a leprosarium, a leper hospital. There is a, and, and they, they, they had their hearts broken when they saw what leprosy does to the human body. 
It's disfiguring. It was just amazing. And they were ministering to the patients across the campus there. And the, the director, after a little bit, came to Pastor Jack and he said, we have a, a chapel if you folks would like to lead us in a worship service. And Jack said, we'd love to. So the Carolina group lined across the front here and they brought in the, the, the lepers, the lepers' patients. Most of them were able to walk and some came with wheelchairs or helping one another. But something is very strange. Pastor Jack, standing in the front, he said, one little woman, one of the women patients, came in and sat on the back row and turned facing the back wall. That was strange. Well, the Carolina group led some songs and prayers and read scriptures and had testimonies. And after a little bit, Pastor Jack said, folks, we have time for one more hymn. Does anybody have a special hymn, favorite hymn you'd like for us to sing? And now for the first time, the little woman on the back row turned to face the front. And Pastor Jack said, I found myself staring into the most hideous face I had ever seen. Because of leprosy, the woman had no lips and no nose. And when she lifted her hand to make a request, there was no hand there, just a bony nub. And she said, could we sing Count Your Many Blessings? And he just lost it. He stood there and the tears came up and choked off his voice. He couldn't get a word out. Had to step out the side door, go outside and just weep. Somebody else stepped up and led the song. One of the men walked outside with him, put his arm around him and said, you'll never sing that song again, will you, Jack? And he said, oh, yeah, but not in the same way. Can you rejoice in the Lord? Can you, can you count your blessings? He said, well, things aren't exactly right. Friend, if you've got to wait till everything is right before you can give thanks, you'll never do it. You live in a fallen world. We are frail creatures. He himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we're but dust. God's under no illusion about you and me. He knows we're made of humble stuff because he's the one who made us. So you do it by faith, not by feelings. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I wonder tonight during the invitation time if you wouldn't just like to come and kneel here at the front or stand here or sit on a pew or something and just pray and give thanks to God for his salvation for you. You haven't done it perfectly. Nobody has done it perfectly. I certainly haven't. Your pastor hasn't, and you haven't either. Don't wait on that in order to, to give thanks to him. Some of us just want to come and pray. I hope a lot of us will fill this altar and do it. Is there anybody here who says, well, preacher, I'm on the outside looking in. I've never been saved. My name is not written in the book of life. Friend, if you've not been saved, if, you've, if your name is not written in the book of life, then it's your fault. Because he's done everything necessary to get you to heaven except force it on you. He brings the salvation right up to your door, stands at your door and knocks and waits on you to say yes to him. Why don't you say yes tonight? Those of you in this room, why don't you just come tonight during the invitation time. Come to the pastor and say, I want to open the door to Jesus. And the pastor is going to help you pray to do just that. I want to lead us in prayer. I'd like for you to stand with us, please. I'd like for you to bow your heads and... Uh, Musicians, go ahead and get in place. The pastor's coming here. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you want to go ahead and be coming to the front to pray, come on, do that. Father, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you. A thousand times thank you for such love as you have for us. Thank you for the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for writing our name down in the book of life, for making us your children. Lord, thank you. How good you are to us. Oh, Lord, forgive us, Father, for taking it lightly or even dismissing it. Oh, Father, draw somebody here tonight, somebody who needs Jesus, somebody who needs to be saved. You're the one who knows who they are. You know what's in our heart, what's not in our heart. Please give us the courage and draw us to you right now, we pray. The invitation is now. Would you come? People at the altar already praying. There's room for you. Plenty of room down front. Come on. Would you do that? Oh, come on, my friend.